want to remind you of what I have talked about last week. Maybe some of you have good memory. Remember not quite a lot. But our memory lasts very short time. Some people say that if you hear something once, after one day you hear, you remember 10%. After two days or three days, you remember 5%. After a week, you remember 1 or 2%. So to make your memory stronger, you have to revise it again and again. Especially when you get older, it is difficult to remember things, especially short-term memory. Very difficult to remember. To get immediately. So I want to remind you of a few things that I talked about last week, just to revive your memory. So you remember the simile that I gave? Gardening. It is very important to remember that simile always in the mind. Always to remember that meditation is cultivating. Bhavana means cultivation to make something grow. So to cultivate, we need to prepare the land, remove all the weeds, rocks, stones, all the rubbish, and till the land so that it becomes soft, and enrich the land with some fertilizer, natural fertilizer especially, and water the land prepare the land properly so that when you put seeds in there, the seeds will sprout easily and take roots easily. And even after that, you can't forget about it. You can't leave it like that. You have to go and check every now and then to see whether some weeds are growing again because it is quite natural for weeds to grow easily. It is harder to grow uh, a flower or a vegetable or a crop then to grow weeds. Weeds grow naturally. They are very hardy, very hard to kill, very, very hard to uproot. That's why farmers spend a lot of time weeding, weeding, weeding. So when we meditate, that's what we do most of the time. We are doing weeding most of the time. So we keep doing that all the time. And to enrich the soil also, what do we do to enrich our mind, cultivate nectar, karuna, be more thoughtful, be more considerate, be kind to yourself and to others too. We cannot, we have no right to be cruel to ourselves even. Some people say that, oh, I suffer from ad- for other people. I think this is not the right attitude. Nobody should suffer. So cultivate kindness to yourself and kindness to other people. And that means also keeping the precepts. If you, keep, if you are really kind to yourself, and if you are really kind to other people, then you are already keeping five precepts. Because you cannot break precepts without being unkind to yourself or to others. So one person say that, I don't kill, and I don't steal, and I don't commit adultery, and I don't cheat or tell lies, I don't boast, but I drink alcohol. I'm not harming to anybody. I'm not causing harm to anybody. I'm just, I just like to drink a little bit. But then you are harming yourself. And indirectly, when we harm ourselves, we harm others too. We are all connected, related. You cannot harm yourself without harming other people without harming your parents, without harming your spouse, without harming your children, without harming your friends even. So we are all related, connected. We cannot harm anybody without harming ourselves or without harming somebody else. So not harming is very important. (coughs) And here's a very beautiful poem which uh, expresses what I am saying now. What power of man can grow a rose? This is a question. What power of man can grow a rose? Prepare the soil. That's what I'm talking about. Prepare the soil. And the rose itself will grow. 
brought into being by some force within. So prepare this one. To achieve peace requires we have the courage of our convictions. We have the courage to value something. So what do we value? As meditators, we value mindfulness, mainly peace of mind, quietness of mind, we value contentment, we value deep insight, we value liberation, freedom, and to use another Pali word, we value Nibbana, ultimate peace, ultimate freedom. But if achieving peace requires we have the courage of our convictions, it also requires an unrelenting consistency. Very important, unrelenting consistency. So if you really value mindfulness, we have to try our best to be mindful always. This is very important, unrelenting consistency. We cannot say that, well now, this is the time from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, I'll be mindful. And after 5 o'clock, I'll be unmindful. We cannot say like that. A person who really understands what meditation means, what mindfulness means, has no time set, no timetable for meditation. What does that mean? No? Say that aloud, please. Yes, mindful at all times. A person who really, really understands what it means to be mindful, how, what happens in the mind when the mind is mindful, and what happens to the mind when it is not mindful. If a person understands the difference, then he will never say that this is the time to be mindful, and that is the time not to be mindful. There's no choice. Because to be unmindful means you are allowing your thoughts to create all sorts of negativity. Because in our surrounding, there are a lot of things contributing negativity, contributing greed, contributing selfishness. They are making us become more greedy, more selfish, more um, unsatisfied. What is that word? Both becoming discontent. So, when I talk about discontentment in America, I said, well, if you are content, then you can reduce the cost of your living to half. Because we are spending so much unnecessarily. So one person said, if you reduce your spending to half, then that will cause a breakdown in the economy. So you should not do that. You should spend more. So they are only thinking about spending economy only, not spirituality. So here you have to make a big choice. What do you value? To develop your inner qualities, your spirituality, or just to keep up with the Joneses. That's what somebody said. I heard about that. So there is no shortcut. Developing, really developing our inner qualities, there is no shortcut. And in America they advertise meditation courses. In three days you become enlightened, you have to pay a thousand dollars. It will take you only three days to become enlightened. No shortcut like that. You can't buy enlightenment. You have to develop your inner quality slowly and slowly. To understand very deeply about all the good things and all the bad things about yourself. And even when you see bad things in you, you have to be very open and compassionate and with acceptance. See that, not as something personal. See all the greed, anger, frustration, pride, envy, jealousy as something natural. So, when you feel guilty about uh, such kind of thoughts, then you are reinforcing ego again. When you can see greed, envy, jealousy, pride as something natural, and that seeing, this seeing mind has equanimity. It is not upset. It is not happy or unhappy about it. If you can see with mindfulness, with equanimity, whatever comes up, then that takes away the ego. It doesn't feed 
the defilements. So the defilements are not afraid of uh, attacking them. Which, no matter how much you try to attack defilements, they will not uh, lose the battle. They will become even stronger. Defilements, which means greed, anger, frustration, envy, jealousy, pride, they are afraid of looking at them very straight, looking at them with equanimity, looking at them with wisdom, looking at them as something natural, not a being, not me, not mine, not myself. So we have to be mindful all the time and doing the right thing all the time. So as a meditator, even when we are not really um, trying to concentrate on something, we should at least maintain some sort of awareness all the time. Whenever thoughts come in, we know what kind of thoughts they are. And just by watching them, sometimes they go away. And sometimes if they don't go away, then we can turn our mind to something wholesome. So in the Pitika text here also, it says that read Dhamma books. Sometimes the emotions, the defilements are so strong that they overwhelm our mind. We don't know what to do. So in that sort of situation, difficult situation, read a Dharma book to divert your mind to something wholesome. And if that's not possible, go and talk with somebody who is very mindful, very peaceful. So to become in contact with somebody who is mindful and peaceful makes you become more mindful and peaceful. It's very important. And therefore, Buddha talk a lot about Kalyanamitta. To be in contact with somebody who is mindful, peaceful. And this is my experience too. My first experience with my teacher also was that he was very mindful and peaceful all the time, even when he was working. So I told you again and again, this is my, my best friend, my first teacher, who was a musician, a musical instrument maker. I still think of him quite a lot. So mindful he was. I never saw him getting upset about anything at all. I never saw him doing anything in a hurry. Always taking his time, doing things very slowly and mindfully, perfectly. He was very perfect in whatever he did. Never found him boasting about anything, any of his uh, accomplishments or qualities uh, or skills. He was a very skillful person too, but he never talked about himself, his skills. Never talk about money. So every day, choose some little thing that you can do to build up your confidence and put it into practice. So this self-confidence, self-respect, feeling of worthiness is very important. If you don't feel worthy, even though you do something, you will not get good results, especially in meditation. Or in other cases too, if you are not confident, if you don't respect yourself, if you don't feel that you are worthy of something, you will not achieve it. So don't forget, beginning is half done and half won. Make it start today. And the nature of wisdom, the nature of insight, is such that if you know that something is good and you don't do it, you lose your insight. This is something very deep, very deep. We should understand it very well. If you know that something is good, like meditation or generosity, dhana, sila, metta, anything that you know this is good, do it. If you know that something is good and you don't do that, your mind gives that up. Maybe you are, sometimes you get interested and you think that, well, I'll do it someday, but you will not do it. So the nature of wisdom is like that. So all of us are, in some ways, very intelligent and wise. Once in a while we know what to do, but we get diverted to something else and we don't do what we think is good to do as soon as possible. So if you put into practice what you feel is a good thing to do, then you develop deeper insight. Even a small thing, especially if it happens in meditation, you sit and meditate, your mind becomes very calm and peaceful, and a flash of insight comes into your mind. You see that you made a mistake, or you see that there is something you need to do and you forget to do. 
So at that moment, get a piece of paper and write down immediately. Don't let it forget. It is very important. Our nature, uh, we are naturally spiritual and intelligent. But this forgetfulness and other things that make us greedy take over our mind very often. So we forget to do good things. So whenever some flash of insight occurs in your mind, get it, take it, catch it. Don't forget it. Get a piece of paper and write down. And then try to put that into practice as soon as possible. Whether it might be a mistake, you, you see that in your meditation, you see that, oh, I've said something wrong. I've said something which is not really true. I must correct that. Just write down and correct that mistake as soon as possible. So if you want to develop deeper insight, put into practice as soon as possible what you understand to be the right thing to do. And if you do just this one thing, I assure you, you can develop your very deep spiritual qualities. This is something that my teacher told me a long time ago and I found it true in my own practice too. Many people came to him and asked him questions and questions and questions. He answered questions, hundreds of questions every day. Some people even asked him very simple questions like, My knee hurt. Should I go and see a doctor? A question like that, they come and ask to my teacher. They can't decide that for themselves. But he was very compassionate. He always gave them the answer that they need. And then, many, many times he said, Be more mindful. Your mind will tell you the right thing to do. It sounds very simple, unbelievable. But if you really uh, do the right thing that you, your mind, tells you to do, it will tell you more and more. So I, I call it it. It's not something personal. Your mind is not really something personal actually. It will tell you the right thing to do. Because nature, in, in our nature, we know what is right and what is wrong. In most cases, I mean, we know that. Not only humans. I read a book about somebody training a chimpanzee. Maybe somebody heard about that, Education of Coco. Uh, they made it into a television show. Right? You've heard about that? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So in that uh, book, I read the book, and I know the trainer to train that chimpanzee. So they have many trainers, but one of them was the chief trainer, an anthropologist, I think. So when they, oh, when that first teacher, uh, I don't know how to say this, they have different, many teachers, one take turn, they take turn. So one teacher came, another teacher was saying that, well, today this chimpanzee is uh, causing a lot of trouble, very naughty, something like that. And this chimpanzee, is, she, is, she was so intelligent that she can understand human language. And she was angry, jumping, because somebody was saying that she was bad. And then she said, no, lying, lying. Like this teacher was lying. And then when this teacher left, she doesn't like this first teacher. The other teacher was more sensitive to the chimpanzee. She could understand the chimpanzee's feelings more intimately. So this other teacher tried to calm down this Coco and she asked, what happened? And she, the chimpanzee said, I was bad. She admitted that I was bad. The teacher was not wrong. When I said she was lying, she knew I was there. So this even chimpanzee knows that she was bad. She was causing trouble. And she said something wrong. Even a chimpanzee knows that. So, how much more a human being can know? But although we know what is right and what is wrong, we don't always do the right thing. We don't always try to avoid the wrong thing. And if we know something and we don't do it, What's the point of trying to fight to know more and more? No matter how much we know, if you don't put into practice, 
what's the point of knowledge? And another thing about this chimpanzee is, another day when the trainer came, the chimpanzee was very upset again. So the trainer asked the chimpanzee, what happened? And the chimpanzee said, cat bad. She can speak, or she can say sign language, cat bad. The cat is not good, chimpanzee said. So the trainer asked, why? So, so chimpanzee said, cat kill bird. She can make all the signs, cat and kill and bird. Speaking in sentence even, you can make up a sentence. So you see, the chimpanzee knows that it is not good to hurt another being. Cat kill bird, that's why cat is bad. And chimpanzee Coco was very upset about that. Because she felt for the bird. Cat kill bird, not good. This cat is not good. And another day, many visitors came to see this Coco, chimpanzee, because she was becoming very famous. Many people went to see her. And one visitor looked at Coco and then said, beautiful. I don't know the sign for beautiful, but I remember one thing. And when the visitor said Coco is beautiful, you know what Coco said? Can you guess? She did like this. This is a sign language, American sign language. You know what that means? That means lying. She scratched her nose like this. So they understand that, lying. And she didn't like that. So even a chimpanzee who is very close to human beings can understand that it is not good to lie. It is not good to kill. We know that. So if we don't put into practice what we know, there is no point in doing, uh, trying to find out more. So if you put into practice what you know is the right thing to do, then your mind will let you know more and more. And this is very encouraging actually. When I, when I first found out about this truth, I felt very happy about that. I have the qualities, the ability to know. So when many people ask my teacher many, many questions, my teacher at last said, try to be more mindful and your mindfulness will let you know the right thing to do. Unless you do something every day to make you feel that you are becoming a better person. So we need to do something every day to make ourselves feel that we are becoming a better person. So unless you do something every day to make you feel that you are becoming a better person, which means more loving, more compassionate, more caring and sharing, more mindful, more understanding, there is bound to be a feeling of failure. Unless you do that, you feel your life as a failure. What am I doing? Going round and round, getting nowhere. And as you get older and older, you feel uh, as a failure more and more. So if we develop our inner qualities, every day we feel happy about ourselves. Oh, another day is gone and I have developed some good qualities. I'm becoming more mindful, more understanding, more, more compassionate. And that will make you very happy. So take small steps to improve yourself every day, consistently and with determination. It gets easier as you go on. As long as you head in the right direction and keep going, you will get there. So we know, actually we know quite a lot. Many of us like to procrastinate. I'll do it later. Many of us procrastinate like that. Hoping maybe if we delay, we will be better equipped to take all the job later. So we need to learn more and more how to do this, how to do this, more and more. We think that if we know more, then we'll be able to do it easier. But that is not the truth. If you do what you know, then it will make it easier for you to learn more and to do more. So doing and knowing should go together. If you will just do one thing, 
that you know to do, if you will take but one step forward, something will happen to make the second step easier. There is a power within you greater than you realize. It awaits you now. So do what you know now and it will make it easier for you to do the next thing. It is as we use that in hand that the greater opportunities are given. Use what you have now. Use your knowledge now. If you use it, then you will get more knowledge from yourself and also from your teachers too. The teachers will come to you or you will you'll be where your teacher is. You will be there. So use what is yours to use today. Your motivation, knowledge, experience, ability. Today's resources are sufficient for today's task. And what you need tomorrow will come. Which means don't wait until tomorrow. You already know what to do now. Do it now. This is the most important thing. So I got very simple instruction from my teacher, meditation teacher, just to sit very relaxed, deep, breathe in and deep out, feel more and more relaxed, keep the mind on breathing. So very simple instruction like that. And after that he said, go through the whole body from the head to toe, check all the sensations in the body. That simple instruction I practiced for six years. No more instruction. That was just enough. Just sitting and breathing, breathing out, feeling more relaxed, and after that, going through the whole body, from head to toe, the whole body, seeing whatever sensation there is. It might be hot, it might be cold, it might be pain, it might be tension, it might be ache, or it might be just feeling good. Sometimes it feels very good, so I am aware of that. Oh, feeling very good, very relaxed, very peaceful. Sometimes thoughts coming in, just watch the thoughts, see the nature of it, it will go away. Everything comes and goes, you don't need to push it away, it will go away by itself. So I did that for six years, not in a hurry. And then later, another teacher told me that, you can practice meditation while walking too. I, and I didn't hear about that before. I thought first, to meditate means to sit in full lotus. So I tried to sit in full lotus. And it was not difficult for me. I showed that a, a few of you uh, the other night. So I'll show you that now. Just to show you that if you are willing to do, you can do it. When we sit, we say, oh, it hurts here, it hurts there, what to do? Don't make it a big, big problem. Try to be with it. Learn from it. So you see, it's so easy to sit full lotus. Without hands, one leg has gone up and another leg, full lotus. No effort. And sit like this for a long, long time. And so, the first thing I heard about meditation was, you sit like this and then keep your hands like this and meditate. So I thought, this is the only position you can meditate. And then later somebody told me that you can meditate while walking. That was a surprise for me. So I said, oh really? How do you do that? So the, the person said, he was actually my friend, next to friend. We were living in a hostel in university. So he was next to me. Sometimes we talk about drama and he said, you can meditate while walking. And I asked him, what do, how do you do that? He said, you can be mindful of breathing while you are not walking. Quite simple. You don't need to change your object of meditation. Just try to be mindful of breathing while you are walking. Or, he said, you can be mindful of each step, putting down, putting down each step. You can do that too. So, in the night when everybody was asleep, I just walked around the campus, university campus, trying just very happy to experiment with it. Just very interested in doing that. It was very nice and quiet and cool also. I think it was in December. So in the Northern Hemisphere it's a cold season. So walking along the university campus, 
very excited. Ah, oh, really, it works. It really works. And then later we discussed about meditation, and he said, you can meditate anywhere. No special place. But if you have a special place, it's good. But if you don't have a special place to meditate, it doesn't matter, you can meditate anywhere. So there was uh, a Chinese cemetery in the east of our university. And this is one of our teachers here, Mac, hmm, sitting here. So he knows the place. So in the east of our university campus is a Chinese cemetery. It's a big cemetery. So we cross over the hill and we went to the Chinese cemetery. It's very nice. It's like a park, neat and clean. So once in a while we go to the Chinese cemetery and sit and meditate there for a while and then come back. Sometimes late in the night when we can't go to the Chinese cemetery, I went to the tennis court. There's a tennis court also. And there are benches to sit. Nobody there at night, late in the night. So I went there and sit on the bench. Meditate. Very peaceful. So learning a few things at a time and immediately putting that into practice. That is the most important thing to do. Don't wait for more knowledge. Do what you know right now. And that will make you know more and more. So when you are really doing something and when somebody gives you an advice, you know the value of that advice because you are already doing it. So if you have difficulty, you are doing something and you have a difficulty. And somebody come and tell you, well, oh, if you do it like this, it will solve your problem. You immediately use that knowledge and solve the problem. And you know the value of the, the advice. But if you are not doing anything, and somebody tells you how to do something again and again. You don't learn anything. You don't value the advice. So this is very, very important. So preparing, there are many things we should, be, we should think about. What you eat affects your mind and body. So a meditator should be aware of that, should be sensitive to that too. Late uh, on the Thursday, I think, one person asked me, he said, on that day, on that night, his meditation was very good. He felt very calm and peaceful, he said. And he asked me, why? In fact, he should ask himself, what have I done right? It's good. Meditation is very good to take. What have I done right? Or if it's not good, you have to ask yourself, what have I done wrong? So you have to think about what you ate and how much you ate also. If you eat a big meal and go and sit and meditate, I'm sure it won't be a very good sitting. So even the quality of your food, if you eat too much fried, oily, fatty food, it makes your mind dull. It affects your mind. And also if you drink too much coffee, it makes your mind agitated. So it depends on the right balance. If you like to drink coffee, drink but just the right amount, just to keep you alert. But don't drink too much, it will agitate your mind. And also, what you talk about is very important. If you talk about something that causes agitation in your mind, and you go and sit, you will not find your meditation sitting very good. It's quite natural. What you talk about affects your mind very, very much. That's why in Burma, in some meditation centers, also here also, I've heard about that, the teachers... Uh, instruct the students not to talk. So, in our daily life, it is not possible for us not to talk. So, we should be careful about what we talk about and how much we talk about. If we talk mindfully, then if we are talking about something not useful, we will be able to cut it short. So, I'm not trying to push you to live an ideal daily life. It is not possible. I, I understand how difficult it is for a lay person to live a uh, daily life. But anyway, if you are mindful, then you will know how what you talk affects your mind, affects your meditation. If you talk about something unwholesome, something that makes you greedy or agitated or angry, upset, or even something that makes you feel hopeless and depressed, it will affect your meditation. So if possible, talk about something positive. Talk about something encouraging. And even though a situation is not um, 
not a happy situation, you can see that from a positive angle and learn something from it. Oh, this is a lesson I need to learn. This is teaching me to be more patient. This is teaching me to be more content. Even somebody who uh, tells you something bad about you, oh, this person is testing me uh, my forgiveness, how much I can forgive, how, can, how much I can maintain my equanimity. So if you look at it from that side, point of view, it helps your meditation. So, and also, it depends on with whom you are associating with. If you will associate with those people who are loving, kind, generous, mindful, peaceful, it helps your meditation too. But if you associate with somebody who are unmindful, jumpy, thinking or talking about one thing after another, or unkind, angry, upset, greedy, proud, if you associate with that sort of person, that person will affect your game. So, Whatever happens to us in our daily life affects our mind and affects our meditation. When you eat something, for a meditator it is very important to understand how food affects your mind. So that's what I do all the time. I check what I eat and how much I eat. Sometimes I eat too much because I don't want to throw away. Because people throw away food and I feel very bad about that. But very carefully, as much as possible, I try to get the right food and the right amount. If I eat the wrong kind of food, my stomach cannot digest, it stays full for a long time, and I don't have energy, the mind gets dull. And only not food, not only food, if you eat the wrong kind of food, uh, it becomes poison to your body. For example, I can't eat anything made with milk because I can't digest lactose. When I eat milk, anything made from milk, uh, my stomach gets upset. It becomes poison. Not only food, what we see poison our mind. So we are more concerned about our body, physical body only. We think so much about our physical body, but not enough about our mind. So we are careful enough not to poison our body. Even in that case, most people are not careful. They are poisoning their body most of the time, eating the wrong food, junk food. So, what we see can poison our mind. What we hear can poison our mind. Because ideas are coming into our mind. Ideas are poison for the mind. So, we need to be very mindful of how ideas affect our mind. Especially with our children too. Be careful what they are getting from the television, from what they hear, from, uh, from their friends, how, what kind of ideas they are getting. So, be very careful about how you see, how you hear affects your mind. A meditator, a good meditator should be careful about that. So, food, clothing also. When you meditate, it is much better to wear loose-fitting clothes and not very expensive, just simple clothes. So, food affects you, and what you talk about affects you, what you see affects you, what you hear affects you, what you wear affects you, and the surrounding the, the, surrounding the place also affects you. So, if you can be in a very peaceful and uh, clean place, it's best to, be med- med- to meditate. The place should be very clean, like this, it's very clean here. And quite peaceful atmosphere here, because a lot of people here uh, are trying to cultivate their spirituality that affects the place too. But sometimes uh, we have no choice. We are in a place, we have no choice, and the place is not suitable um, to meditate. In that case, what shall we do? Uh, So I'll tell you what I did. It is very, very useful, and I do that all the time, every day. And I'll tell you the story so that you get the idea very well. Once I was in America, living in a monastery, and there were about seven or eight monks, and about more than twenty people in that place. It was a, a school for children, but this meditation group bought that school and made it into a monastery, a meditation center. 
So I was the only English speaking monk in that monastery. So I talk a lot all day. From about five o'clock in the morning, I'll be talking and talking and talking until about eleven, twelve in the night. So sometimes I get very tired and stressed. Sometimes so many people around making so much noise, it disturbs my mind. More or less, it disturbs my mind. So I told one friend, it's very difficult here to meditate and to relax. And sometimes I want to relax. I can ignore the noise and relax. So when I want to relax, I wrote on a piece of paper, "Please do not disturb," and I stick, I will stick the paper on the door outside my room. But there were so many people who need to talk to me that they come and knock the door, and then they took off the paper and showed me. Maybe you forgot to take it off. So no time to rest. All day talking, talking, talking. So I want to go away, run away. I can't do any more. So I told my friend, "What to do now?" I can't go on doing like this for a long time. So my friend said, "Oh, I'm very sorry. Let's go into the redwood forest." So the monastery is in a redwood forest, actually. So we walked up the hill. It was a very nice place, actually. The moment we walked outside, and it was forest, no house. In that area, they are not. They don't allow many houses. So one house here, and you go for one mile and find another house. So we walked out of the monastery. The path was very simple, just uh, rocks and gravels, and up the hill, and go down another hill, and climb another hill, and found a very nice spot. They cut down a big forest redwood tree, and when they cut down the tree. Small trees grows from the roots again, so that it's like a ring. They grow in the ring, and inside that area, uh, the redwood trees, leaves, uh, needles uh, fill that gap. So it's like a bed, it's soft. So we found a place like that and spread a cloth, and then we sat there and meditate. Very nice to be to meditate in the redwood forest. Very quiet and peaceful. Sometimes we lie down and take a nap in the afternoon, then come back to the monastery. So that helps quite a lot. And then sometimes I cannot go out. So what I did was I just sat in my room and imagined that I was back in my monastery in Burma. So don't think that imagination is useless. It affects my mind very much, so I sat there, breathe in and breathe out, breathe in and breathe out, relax and relax and relax. My mind became a little bit calm, and peaceful. The way to my monastery goes through rice fields, paddy fields. So on the left and on the right, paddy fields, green, very white, and the wind flowing, very cool, and I can hear the birds. And then I'll go slowly and slowly, imagining that I was really there, walking on that road, feeling the temperature, the wind, the sound, the smell of the rice field, and then going across a small bridge, a wooden bridge. It is called Nyati Da 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 in Burmese. Da Da means bridge. Nya means the fire. Nya, just say and say. Okay, Nya. The fire, emerald. Okay, emerald. And tida means what is it? Tida, tida. Something cool. Tida also means water. So nya tida bridge. It's a wooden bridge, and there's a bench on the side to sit. And there's also a small waterfall near the bridge. So in my imagination, I'll be there and sit on that bench for a while and listen to the water falling from the bridge or from the waterfall. And also the wind blowing, very cool. And then from that, after I cross the bridge, uh, I climb a uh, very gentle slope going up a hill to my monastery, and it goes through a small opening. And on the side is a both sides cliff. So in between there's a small road about eight or ten feet wide. And with bamboo groves and other small trees growing, 
So I, went, I would go through that place and climb the hill slowly and slowly. When I got to the top, it's flat and not many big trees there. I can look around and see everything around. So I look far away and see the mountains in the east, Chan Hill. And then I keep going slowly and slowly, feeling everything in that area and the surroundings. And then after that, I have to go slowly down the hill again to, go, to get into my monastery. So the slope goes down slowly and slowly. So as I go into my monastery, the trees are becoming bigger and bigger because people don't cut down trees in the monastery. Outside the monastery, they cut down. So as I go into my monastery, the trees become taller and taller and taller and become more and more shady and it becomes cooler and cooler and cooler and also more and more quiet because the tree absorbs noise. So as you go into the tree, it becomes more quiet, more cool. So cooler and more quiet and then I'll go deep into my monastery. In the, in the middle of the monastery, there's a small place with no trees, it's a clear place. So near that place is the shrine room and meditation hall. Not as big as this, it's quite small. So I'll go into my meditation hall, shrine room, close the door. So as I go into my monastery, even physically when I go there, I feel that I was leaving the whole noisy, busy world behind. Leaving the noisy and busy world behind, it has nothing to do with my place. My monastery is just outside the world, not uh, disconnected, it's in touch with the world, but not inside the world. That's the way we feel it. So I'll go into the monastery and feel that all the noisy, busy world is uh, left behind. And get into the place, pay respect to the Buddha, sit down and meditate. So that takes about five minutes to imagine. But that imagination affects my mind very, very much. So try to do that. If you can't find a suitable place to meditate, try to imagine that you are in your ideal meditation place. Take your time, slowly and slowly. So when your mind believes that and accepts that, it affects your mind. You know that you are imagining, you know that it is not real, but even though it is not real, it has real effect on your mind. And that's the most important thing. So you sit down and meditate. Your mind becomes very calm and peaceful. So if you imagine bad things, it affects your mind in a bad way. If you imagine good things, it affects your mind in a good way. Quite natural. So try to do that. So last week also I talked about these things, and I talk about Yoni Sir Manasikara also. Yoni Sir Manasikara means, Manasikara means any kind of wholesome thinking, any kind of thought that is wholesome. <coughs> so we can't make ourselves not to think about anything at all, because thoughts are coming and going all the time. But sometimes we have a choice to turn our mind to wholesome thoughts. As much as possible throughout the day, try to do that. When you get used to doing that, your mind will stay in this wholesome state of mind more and more. So, and whenever any kind of unwholesome thoughts come to your mind, you find that your mind becomes uneasy, not peaceful, agitated, tired. You will find the difference. Some people are so used to thinking unwholesome thoughts that they like to think unwholesome thoughts. They like to be angry and upset most of the time. I know some people like that. So, I asked that person, why do you want to make yourself get angry? You are making yourself angry. Do you know that? And he said, yes, I know I'm making myself angry. And I asked him, why do you do that? This person knows that he is making himself angry. Deliberately thinking about bad things, making himself angry. And he said, when I am angry, then I feel more energy. Some people do that, I think, to make themselves angry so that they feel more energy. And this person will try to think about all the things that goes wrong, about people, about government, about weather, about food, about everything. 
about everything in the newspaper, everything in the television, something is always wrong for him. So I asked him, why do you want to see all the faults? So we are very close friends, so we can talk very, very openly. And this person said, if you don't know what is wrong, then you are stupid. So what is he trying to prove? He's trying to prove that he is not stupid by looking at all the things that goes wrong. So when we get upset, try to look deep inside. Why are we doing that? We are trying to prove something. So what do we get from that? Whenever we do something, we expect something. So what do we get from being upset? Trying to prove that he is not stupid. And also, to be more energetic. And another thing is, I found out that this person is not doing anything wholesome. So when you are really interested in doing something wholesome and useful, whether worldly or whether meditation, then you have no time thinking uh, unwholesome thoughts. You have no time to look around and find faults with other people. So those who are not doing something wholesome will naturally do something unwholesome. You cannot stay in between. Stay in between. For most people, there is only two ways, to be wholesome or to be unwholesome. So when you become used to keeping your mind peaceful and calm and relaxed, the moment any kind of un unwholesome thought comes into your mind, you feel the difference. You become unpeaceful, agitated, hot. You become tired. So when I talk about keeping five precepts, uh, with some other person, that person asked me, how long I, do I need to keep the five precepts intact to start to meditate? So this is a very valid question, a good question. Some people say that, first of all, you have to develop your sila, you have to keep your sila, five precepts, intact before you meditate. But how long? It's very difficult to say how long. So, I asked this question to some of my teachers too, and also try to find out in the text what it says, and I get a very reasonable answer. The answer is, it doesn't matter how long, the only thing that matters is your sincerity. If you decide right now that I will not harm myself, I will not harm anybody else. In that moment, you can start meditating. But if you still have in your mind that you will harm somebody, then even though you meditate, you cannot really develop uh, deep concentration, peacefulness, insight. But you need the intention not to harm yourself and others. Intentionally make a decision. And that is a necessity. So, honestly, make a decision then. I will not harm myself and I will not harm anybody else. With sincerity, if you can make the decision from that moment, you are ready to meditate. So it all goes together. Sila, Metta, and Vipassana Bhavana, they all go together. You cannot leave anything separate. So we have a tendency to keep things separate. I don't know another of my We'll find another note. Oh, here it is. Each aspect of our lives is connected to every other aspect of our lives. Very, very important this is also. Especially for meditators. Each aspect of our lives is connected to every other aspect of our lives. Whatever you do will affect your meditation, either in a good way or in a bad way. This truth is the basis for our awakened life. This is the basis. So one person who was a member of a meditation center, not here in Burma, he was a businessman, and in his business dealings he was dishonest. So one of his friends pointed that out. He said, look, you are meditating to develop your spiritual qualities to attain liberation, something very noble and high. 
and in your business dealings, you are not really honest. He is cheating a little bit and everybody do that. It's not anything, like, he was not exceptionally bad, but he was just normally bad. So this person said, oh the two are different. When I go to the meditation center, I meditate and, and I try to develop my spiritual qualities to attain liberation. But when I'm doing business, it's business. It's another matter. No way you can do that. So keep this in mind and see what you are doing, whether you are doing is uh, appropriate to your spiritual ideals. What is your ideal? And always keep your ideal in your mind and always check with everything you do, whether what you are doing now will harm your spiritual practice or will support your spiritual practice. What counts is how we live our daily lives, how constructively we use the resources we have and how lovingly we treat the people around us. The two keys to successful living are attunement to spirituality and service to our fellow men. So the two goes together. If we harm anybody in any way, it will harm our spiritual practice. So, Sila has many aspects. <coughs> Keeping five precepts, and whenever we use something, we have to reflect why we are using that. But when we eat something, we have to reflect on that. Why do I eat? When we use clothing also, why do I use these clothing? If we don't reflect on that, then greed will take over and we will eat greedily and we will wear clothes greedily with greed just to show off and whenever we see or hear something try to be, we have to be very mindful uh, so that we will not react automatically so when we go down the road go down to a busy shopping center and try to be mindful and see what happens our eyes looking here and there all the time and we try to listen to many things. So we are not trying to be mindful at that moment. When we are not mindful, then we become more, more and more agitated. And there are a few other things that hinders our attainment, our, our spiritual attainment. One is killing one's mother. If somebody has killed one's mother, he cannot attain Megapala, enlightenment. He can meditate, but he will not achieve uh, supramundane, what they call that, consciousness. But to kill a mother, to kill a father, and to kill an arahant, and to cause blood to Buddha, and wrong views, <coughs> that is also very important. Uh, if somebody believes that there is no such thing as wholesome or unwholesome actions, everything is the same. If somebody believes like that, if somebody believes that if you do something good, it will not give you any good result. If you do something bad, it will not give you any bad result. If a person believes that sort of wrong view, he can not attain any spiritual goal. But I know you, you don't have those sort of uh, wrong views. And if somebody has accused uh, at least a certain plan of something, then that also, that accusation also will hinder that person's progress. So if you have done, uh, even mentally, if you have accused anybody, any fellow meditator even, if you have any bad thoughts about that person, remember that and ask for forgiveness. At least Tell to yourself, I have made a mistake. I will not do that. So it is very important to have positive thoughts about each other. If you have any negative thought for each other here or any other people who are meditating, that negative, unkind thought can hinder your progress. So that's why when we sit and meditate, first of all we try to develop this feeling of belonging, connectedness, support, loving, kind thoughts. It's very important to do that. So whenever you sit and meditate, whether in group or in alone, or alone, 
first think of those people and try to develop metta for them. I support their practice. If you don't support their practice, then you feel isolated. You feel very selfish. When some meditators accuse each other, uh, I notice that that causes them guilty feeling and agitation. And that destroys their samadhi, concentration. This is another important point here. Somebody asked me a similar question a few days ago. Uh, some people are meditating for quite a long time, but mostly they are doing only one thing. For example, sitting and trying to be mindful of breathing. Breathing in and breathing out, just one thing. So here the Buddha said, Chattaro Satipatthani Full foundation of mindfulness. So we have to practice all four foundations of mindfulness, not just one. To really develop deep insight, we need to practice all four. So the first you know is Kayanipatthana. And I will go through that later in, brief, uh, in detail. So the second is Vedana Nupasana. And even Kaya Nupasana, there are many aspects. And I think Venerable Nyana Visodhi explained you quite a lot about these four foundations of mindfulness. He told me that. So you have enough knowledge of that. And another is Chitta Nupasana. Mindfulness of thoughts. Another is Dhamma Nupasana which generally means the content of any consciousness. So try to develop all four as much as possible. Slowly and slowly develop. Take in. So this Dharivathana meditation is all inclusive. It's not exclusive. Samatha meditation is exclusive. You choose one thing and you leave everything out. But Dharivathana, Vipassana meditation is first you start with one thing Slowly and slowly you take in more and more to be aware of everything happening in your body, in your mind. In your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, everywhere. And learning about the uh, meditation also, whenever we want to do something, we need to learn the method from somebody. So we have enough method in the um, Pali text and there are a lot of teachers around too, so to learn the method is not very difficult anymore. But one important thing is to clarify whether you have understood it well or not. Ask questions. So learning in Pali means out de sa and pari pucha means to ask questions. This is very important. Don't just sit and listen and make notes and Go away. Ask questions. This is the best way to learn. Either meditation or any other kind of learning, those who ask more questions, I mean really thinking and asking questions, and really listening to understand more, and asking again and again until you get very clear, is the best way to learn. So discussion is very important, and Yoni Sarmanasrikara, it has many meanings, but here it means to really practice. So learn the method, ask questions to clarify and practice. And as you practice, you find some difficulties coming up. Whenever you have difficulty, ask your teacher, talk with your teacher, take the advice. But in most cases, if you keep on practicing, you get your own answer. This is true. So, for example, we live in the forest most of the time, sometimes we are very far away from our, our teachers. We can only see our teachers once a month. So, we sit there and meditate, we have difficulties. And we think, oh, I, I, I will ask this to my teacher when I go to see him. And then we go on meditating and meditating, and someday the answer comes in the mind. We don't have to ask anymore. But many other students also, so I go to their city sometimes, and when I go away, they have difficulties, they write down the questions about their difficulties, thinking that I'll ask my teacher when he comes. But they keep meditating, really earnestly, honestly, wholeheartedly, 
and then they find their own answer. So when I went and see them, this, many of my students said, uh, I wrote down a lot of questions to ask you when you come. But as I keep meditating, I find my own answers. So now I don't have many answers, just one or two. So if you keep meditating, you'll find your own answer. And Kalyana Maita Sevana Bhajana Pai Upasana It all means the same thing. Kalyana Maita means a good friend. And a good teacher is a good friend. A teacher and a friend, they are the same. Not two different things. Even Buddha talk about himself as a good teacher. So to have a good teacher, to have a good friend, and to be in touch with the teacher, to ask him questions, to take his advice, all this is very important. Without a teacher and without a friend, without a guide, it will be very, very difficult for us to go on this path. You will make a lot of mistakes, you will sidetrack a lot. <clears throat> so in the beginning stage of meditation, naturally we choose one object of meditation and try to keep our mind concentrated on that object. <clears throat> for example, breathing in and out. So we try to keep our mind there as much as possible. So as we keep our mind there, slowly and slowly we develop more concentration. Our mind stays on that, on that object longer and longer. So as our mind becomes a little bit calm, we can see the changing nature of this sensation, of this object. So even in meditation, uh, in this mindfulness of breathing, there are many, many steps. If you do each step systematically, it's much easier to develop mindfulness and concentration. So for example, the first thing you know is that you are breathing. If you know that you are breathing, then you have to take one step. Because most of the time, although we are breathing, we don't know that. Why? Because we are thinking about something else. All the time thinking, thinking, thinking. What do we think about most of the time? Sometimes we don't even know what we think about. Most of the time we don't know what we think about. It happens so unconsciously. So, whenever we know that we are breathing, that helps our mind bring back to this present moment. I am breathing. That's one step. And the next step is breathing in. You know that we are breathing in. When breathing out, you know that you are breathing out. That's another step. Breathing in and out. And the next step is when you breathe in, it takes about three or four seconds if you breathe in slowly. It takes about three seconds. And breathing out another three seconds. So in that time, three, two or three seconds, your mind can go out many times. So in going in and out many times, it can happen. So to help your mind not to go away, you can do another thing, which means uh, in Pali it means ganana naya. Ganana naya means counting. You break down your breathing in into five sections. So that you can be mindful five times when you breathe in. You can bring back your mind five times when you breathe in. And also the same thing when you breathe out, you, you count five times when you breathe out. So, one, two, three, four, five. Make it into smaller sections. Helps you to be more aware of your breath. There is a misunderstanding about this method. The, misunderstand, the misunderstood method is that some people say when you breathe in and breathe out, count one. And then you breathe in and out and count two. Which means that you are counting how many times you breathe. You breathe. That also helps you to keep your mind on breathing too. But the real purpose of this Kanana Naya means that you are trying to be more aware of your in-breath so that you can, your mind cannot go away in between. If you are aware of your in-breath five times, then it is more difficult for, my, your, for your mind to wander away. So it so happens that when you breathe in, you are aware in the beginning and you are not aware in the middle and in the end. It can happen. So 
in order for that not to happen, you keep your mind again and again, five times at least. It can be more than five, but the maximum should not be more than ten. Because if you count ten times, then you count very fast. And it causes agitation. So depending on how long you breathe in and how long you breathe out, you count minimum five times and somewhere between five and ten. It doesn't matter, the number doesn't matter. You need to understand the purpose of counting. The purpose is to keep your mind again and again and again and again in your breathing. So don't try to reach the number. This is very important. Don't try to make it uh, to count faster so that you'll finish counting as you finish breathing. Just count naturally, evenly, and keep your mind there. And when you keep your mind there, where do you keep? You keep your mind on the sensation, not on the concept. Breathing in means breathing actually is a concept. It's an idea. In Pali it is called pinyati. And I have to explain this word pinyati again and again, many, many times. It will take many, many times to explain. Pinyati and paramatha, the two words, need to be explained quite a lot. Because in many, many cases, instead of keeping the mind on paramatha, most meditators keep their mind on pinyati because that's what they have been doing. We keep our mind on pinyati. So I try to translate this word many, many times and we discuss about this with Venerable Yanavisari also. In the translation they say pinyati means concept. And what does concept mean? When you hear the word concept, how do you understand that? A word, a name. So we try to find out the meaning and we couldn't find a, a real exact translation in English. So whenever Yana we said he suggests one word which is designation. So pinyati, slowly I will explain that. Names are pinyati. Any name is pinyati. And in and out direction is pinyati. When you call something air, that name is pinyati. Because in fact, what we call air is a combination of many elements, not just one, many elements. So when you take things together and give it a name, or understand it, it as one thing, then you are understanding pinyati, not really paramatha. So when you breathe in, the direction is not important, the naming is not important, because direction is pinyati, naming is pinyati. What is paramatha is what you feel directly. So what do you feel when you breathe in? Where does that feeling happen? Where does that sensation happen? Sensation is what is real. So what do you feel when you breathe in? Breathe out. Something gently touching, rubbing, pushing. This gently touching, rubbing and pushing sensation is the real thing to keep your mind on. And temperature also, cool or warm. So, around your nose, somewhere you can feel something happening when you breathe in and breathe out. So keep your mind there and try to keep your mind many, many times bringing it back as you breathe in and as you breathe out. But do that only for a short amount of time only, because even the counting is another pinyati. Numbers are all pinyati, not paramatha. But we use the numbers, we break down our breath into smaller pieces so that we can be more aware of it, we can be continuously aware of it. That is the most important point, to be continuously aware of the breath without any break in between. So if you understand the purpose of a method, then you can let go of the rest of the things and just do that. Keep your mind where it touches, uh, when the air comes in and goes out, keep your mind on where it touches. Keep it there continuously without any break. Try your best. So only in the beginning, try to count or try to say in and out, but after a while let go of in, let go of out, let go of counting and just be with the breath.
without any idea. So as you develop a certain level of concentration, you become aware of the changing nature of the breath, I mean the sensation. Even what we call breath is a pinyati. What we directly know is the sensation. So check yourself whether you are doing that when you are meditating. Where is your mind? What are you thinking about? So if you have any question about this, it is very important to ask and make it clear. Because if you are not keeping your mind on paramatha, then your mind can become calm and peaceful and concentrated, but you cannot see the reality. So there are two parts in meditation. The first part is to calm down, to develop concentration, so that your mind don't get, doesn't get distracted. To calm down the thoughts and keep your mind on one object. That's the first object of meditation, first purpose of meditation. And the second, which is more important, is to understand the way things are. Whether you call it reality or what, to understand the way things are. Whether it's physical or whether it's sensations or feelings or thoughts, whatever, to understand things as they are. Buddha, Buddha, To, Pasati. In Bali it means. So, if we keep our mind on pinyati, we can become calm and peaceful and concentrated, but we will not see nama as nama, we will not see rupa as rupa. Because we are not trying to be in touch with the nature of nama and rupa. We are just keeping our mind on a pinyati, a designation. So, shapes are pinyati. Size, small or big. Any size, any kind of shape and size is pinyati. East, west, north, south, it's pinyati. Just to get to give you more idea about what pinyati means. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all pinyati. Just names. And also the calendar, the dates, also pinyati. So when you meditate and keep your mind on what you can really directly experience, all those disappear. Sometimes you don't even know where you are sitting, whether you are facing east or west. You don't know that anymore. And sometimes it happens, very strange feelings happen. You don't even know who you are sometimes. Because who you are is another idea that you create in your mind. But to get to that point, you need to have a deep insight of anatta. When your mind uh, has developed this wisdom of anatta, sometimes you don't even know your name. You have to think about it for a while. It takes time to think about it. But that will happen, that will come later. So if you have any question about paramatha and pinyati, please ask this. This is very important. We discuss about it in the night sometimes. It takes many days to discuss. Very, very interesting. Whenever Nana Visedi and I would sit and discuss about Tignati and Paramatha and the object of Vipassana, sometimes it takes a long time. We forget about time even. We will sit and discuss about it from 9 o'clock in the, in the evening, thinking that we will discuss about one hour, and we forget about time, because time is pinyati. And when we look at that clock, it's about 11.30. Very important. I think whenever Nana we said he explained this to you too. If you have more questions, please ask about this. So now is the time to ask questions now. If there any question, please feel very free. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is this long and short is pinyati? That's right, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. When you think about long, what do we mean? So the important thing is not to keep your mind on the word. The important thing is when it is long, you know the whole thing from the beginning to the end. 
You keep your mind on the touching sensation, the place where the in-breath and out-breath touches, and keep your mind there no matter how long it takes, whether it is short or long. So in the beginning only, you know that it is long, you know that it is short, because this is only in the beginning stage. Just like, just to know that you are breathing is first stage. And just to know that you are breathing in and you are breathing out is another stage. And just to know that you are breathing in long, breathing out long is another stage. Or breathing in short, breathing out short. But after that you let go. Let go of long and short, but be with the breath continuously from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Not more than ten. Yes. Yes, can vary. Yes, that is true. That's why I told you not to try to count to a certain exact number. That the number, how many numbers, is not important. The important point is your mind is staying there, staying there, staying there. This is only in the beginning, that's why I said. Once you get to a certain level of concentration, let go of the counting and see if if your mind can stay there. Because we have the habit of thinking so much and it happens so quickly and easily that when we breathe in a long breath, we'll be aware of breathing in, in the beginning only, for uh, number one, two, three, and then we forget about Six, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. Forget about that. We think about something else. So not our, in order that we don't slip away, we try to catch it back again and again to keep it in our breath. So that is the purpose of counting. So when let go of the counting and stay with the breath, and if you can stay with the breath without counting, don't count anymore. Because counting becomes another hindrance later. Because it's just number. We are not trying to understand number actually. We are trying to understand the bodily sensation. Right, right, right. That's what I said just now. Uh, we, to know that your breathing is pinyati, to know that it is coming in and out is also pinyati. And to keep your mind on counting is also pinyati. To know that it is long or short is another pinyati. But this is good in the beginning. And when you can stay with your breath without thinking of any word, that's the best thing to do. Without thinking of any word, because long and short is another idea and word. What do you mean by long and short? Comparison. So the main uh, thing that we should do is to be with the breath continuously. And if you can stay with that, let go of everything else. Short or long doesn't matter. Counting doesn't matter. In, out doesn't matter. Hmm? Hmm? Right? Right, yes. Just to help your mind from being distracted. Just to help your mind from... Quiet down. Yes, quiet down, yes. So, only in the beginning stage, when you sit for a while, just for a few minutes, try to do that, and then let go. Because we have been going around doing so many things that naturally our mind is speeded up, it's thinking too much. So when we begin, start thinking, sitting in meditation, ah, breathing in, breathing out, and then try to count it a little bit only. See if you can stay with the breath. If you can stay with it, Let go of all the words, all the ideas.
Mm-hmm. Yes, that will come later in the, in the coming weeks because today we will talk about the very beginning stage and then slowly and slowly we will develop into deeper and deeper aspects of meditation. Yes, so please give me some time.